Uh, <clears throat> starting from tomorrow night, leading up to Vision Sunday on 20th of this month, the church will be open from Monday to Friday for two weeks for those who'd like to join in corporate prayer gatherings. The prayer meeting will start at 7 p.m. each night and run for about an hour and each night it will be facilitated by a different individual from our church family. Uh, we acknowledge that we have not yet escaped from the pandemic and the number of people in our church family are in the vulnerable category. So if you are concerned for your health or showing any COVID symptoms, we encourage you to stay and pray at home. But for those who would like to come and join us, you are more than welcome. And during this season, though you may not come, we, uh, we would love to pray for you. So let us know your prayer requests by filling out an orange card. And during this season, we would pray for you and your families. Now, speaking of a prayer, let me start with asking this question. Do you pray? Do you pray? If you do, when you pray the last time, what did you pray for? Uh, about a year ago, Gabby and I moved into a new house. When we saw the house for the first time, we loved it. It has a small garden uh, at the back, and it has a small yard at the front. And there are different types of trees, plants, and flowers around the house. And we loved it. We thought, oh, they are so lovely to look at. But after we moved, it, moved it into the new house, we realized there was a big problem. Big, big problem. That is, Gabby and I are not gardeners. When we first moved in, we did not know much about gardening, and we still do not know much about it. You know, for the, for, uh, for the last uh, couple of months, the weather has been very interesting, hasn't it? You know, it has been so wet and so hot, and I did not know the plants and trees would grow that quickly during the summer season. And the weeds, they are uncontrollable. You know, sometimes I would go out there and look closely at the garden, and I would think, oh, I've never seen that thing planted in my garden before. And I look around, there are hundreds of them. You know, farmers may hate me for praying this, but my prayer in summertime will always be, let there be less rain this year. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I, see, I hear people's, people's getting offended. <laughs> you know, do you remember the last sermon, last Sunday? Don't get offended. So when you prayed the last time, what did you pray for? It could be about weather. It could be that your favorite tennis player would win. It could be for a parking space in the shopping center. Who has not prayed for a parking space in the shopping center before? You know, there are hundreds of things that we pray for. And we also pray in more troubling, troubling times for more important things. We pray for those who are unwell around us. We pray that our loved ones would come to know God and His love. We pray for jobs and healings of relationships in our lives. A study suggests that even non-religious people pray at times. One study suggests that nearly 30% of atheists pray regularly. And in this age, more and more people pray. Most people at some point in their lives pray. Prayer is one of the most universal instincts. 
then how do we know prayer works? How does prayer work? How should we pray? As we embark on a journey of a 14-day prayer relay tomorrow, we will explore Christians' perspective on prayer today and on the following Sunday. And to do that, we will delve into the story of this guy named Elijah in the Old Testament. And many of you would find today's story particularly interesting as it answers three of the most important questions about prayer. And we will look at them this morning. They are, who should we pray to? How do we know prayers actually work? And how, why should we pray at all? Does this sound interesting to you? Yeah. Then please join me in prayer as we begin. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the gift of your word. And this time, we we take a moment to really hear your voice and discern your voice. Your words have the power to renew our minds and reset our hearts and revive our lives. So we come to you, Lord. And Jesus, we know that you're present with us, and you have the words to speak to us. So we open our hearts and be ready to listen. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In your name we pray this, amen. So now, let me first share with you the context of the story. During the 8th to 9th century BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was in the darkest time of its history. There was a king named Ahab, and he married a woman named Jezebel from a place called Tyre. And what's interesting about this foreign queen was that she was a very religious person. People of Tyra worshipped a god called Baal. And she and Ahab did the best that they could to spread foreign religion in Israel at the great expense of Israel's religion. Jezebel even tried to kill all the prophets of the god of Israel for her religion to flourish and thrive in Israel. And here is why. The god Baal was believed to be a rain god. In the Middle East and agricultural society that they were living in, rain was crucial. It was like gold falling from the sky. And they believed the worshiping Baal would make the land fertile and fruitful. But the Baal worship did not work. There was a severe and terrible drought in the land of Israel. And it lasted for three years, and people became very desperate. And this is the context of the story that was just read to us. You know, today, you and I live in the world that is very like Israel in Elijah's time. We live in religious pluralistic society. Today, some would would use a golden wheel to pray at a Buddhist temple. Some would go to a meditation class to pray. Some would go to a shrine to pray. And some would pray five times a day facing a sacred place. Just like Israel in 9th century BC, we now live in a religious pluralistic world. And in our culture today, many people would say, oh, well, it does not matter who you pray to or what you believe in. All religions are the same. All faiths lead to God. You have probably heard someone say, it does not matter which path of the mountain you choose to climb. Whichever path you choose, we will all end up reaching the same top of the mountain. But here in the text, we see Christianity takes an opposing view. Standing on the Mount Carmel, 
Elijah makes this bold statement to 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And the all Israelites, he says, if the Lord, the God of Israel is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. It is to say that there is only one true God. And someone puts it this way. Saying all religions are the same is like saying all sports are the same. Think about this. Rugby players would be greatly offended if they were asked to play as if they were playing soccer. Nor they would be able to play soccer. You know, rules are different. Soccer field and football field are set up differently. And the numbers of the players in the fields are different. And for the same reason, we would not say table tennis and tennis are the same sports. People will be greatly offended, I know. And we would not say baseball or baseball and cricket are the same sports. We would not say that. In the same way, religions are not the same. Then how is Christianity not like other world's religions today? How do we know that only the Christian faith leads to God? The answer is actually quite simple. No other religions claim to lead to God. For example, Buddhism claims that if you follow the path of a Buddha, then you'll eventually lose your own personal identity and get observed into the cosmic oneness. And Hinduism teaches something similar. It says that there is no personal God to be encountered. Really, the goal of Hinduism is effectively personal annihilation. And many Eastern religions models on the same kind of idea. And what about Islam? If you read the Quran carefully, you do not find God very relatable. For example, though Quran talks about the afterlife, it is described in terms of pleasures, physical pleasures. It talks about beautiful fruit trees, rivers of wine, and women there for men to enjoy. But God is very much absent in that picture. As you study the great faith traditions of the world, you would discover that only one religion actually claims to lead you to God, and that is the Christian faith. You know, the Bible makes this tremendous promise that those who put their faith in Jesus are put into a relationship with God and they even get to call God a father. You know, God being a father is a uniquely Christian idea. A young soldier was fighting for the Union Army in the American Civil War, and he lost both his father and brother in the fighting. He had a sister and elderly mother to look after. So this young man decided to go to president and ask for an exemption from military service. When he arrived in Washington, he walked straight up to the doors of the White House and asked to speak directly to the president. But of course, the guard at the door said to him, oh, president is too busy to meet you. Just go home. Just go home. Devastated, this young man was sitting at a, a nearby park bench. And there was this young boy came up to him and said, what's wrong? Why are you so sad? The soldier looked at the boy and began to pour out his heart. Then, taking this young man by the hand, this young boy led a soldier back, to, back around to the White House. They walked through the back door, past the guards, past the generals, and past the high-ranking officials. And then they got to the president's office. 
The boy did not even knock on the door. He just opened the door and walked in. Then, standing behind the desk, studying the battle plans, there was Abraham Lincoln. And he said, Dad, this man needs to talk to you now. <laughs> the Christian faith says that God is a personal and relational God who would sympathize with us when we cry out to Him. And that we would have a relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus. The Apostle Paul takes it even further to say that we would be even adopted as sons and daughters of God through Jesus. And we would call God Abba, which is the Aramic word for Daddy. You know, Jesus himself teaches us to call God our Father. This is a uniquely Christian idea. You know, in the story of Elijah, we see something very interesting. The prophets of Baal, to get the attention of their God, they call on his name all day. They shout, they dance around the altar, and they even harm themselves to impress their God. But there is no response. No one pays attention to them. And this talks about how the Christian faith is distinct and different from other world's religions. You know, in other belief systems, you would think that you have to make effort and perform. Maybe you should pray in a certain way or in certain times and, and places. And you may even have to live a certain way to get God's attention. But the Christian faith says that you are in a loving relationship with God who you would call Daddy through Jesus. The other day, I took my son Daniel to a nearby park. And he was playing on the playground. There were dozens of young children playing. But by the time we left for home, I was amazed that I could not remember who else was there on the playground. I could not remember the faces of other children. Why? Because the whole time my eyes were fixed on my son Daniel intensely, not wanting him to hurt himself. The Bible says that this is the kind of relationship that you have with God in Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to impress God in Jesus Christ. You already have God's full attention. Hallelujah. Because you are His child. You're His child. Then you might think, okay, Noah. How can you be so sure that God is our Father who would give His ease when we cry out to Him? How can you be so sure that He cares for me and loves for me? And we see the answer in the story. You know, whereas the prophets of Baal do everything that they can to impress their God, do you remember what Elijah does? Elijah does everything he can do to make it hard for God to turn up. You know, Elijah first sets up 12 stones to build an altar. And then he dugs a trench around the altar. And he fills four large jars with water and pours them on the wood. And he does that three times. And by the time he finishes the wood, the altar is soaked, and even the trench around it is filled with water. Then, when Elijah prays a simple prayer, Lord, the God of Israel, answer me so that they may know that you are God. The fire falls from the sky. It burns up the sacrifice, the wood, and the stones, and it even leaks up the water in the trench. It's a miracle. It's a miracle, isn't it? 
And this tells us about God's incredible love for us, for you. Commentators say something like this. The 12 stones and 12 jars of water represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And the water that made it almost impossible for the wood to burn represents the sin of God's people in Elijah's time, which was so great that it was impossible to fix the damage caused by it. But miraculously, the fire comes down from the sky and it burns up the sacrifice and it licks up the water in the trench. And it talks about God's grace that is bigger and stronger than the sin of Israel and his heart for Israel that he had not given upon Israel. In the same way, in our sin, it was impossible for us to get near God as there can be no sin in him. The debt had to be paid. Sin had to be washed away. The water in the trench had to be licked up. And see how God did it. The fire falls on the sacrifice on the wood. And it licks up the water in the trench. This is to tell us that Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, was put on the wood, the cross, and Jesus took up our shame and our guilt on himself, and he died on the cross. Hallelujah. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. The fire did not fall on the Israelites, but on the sacrifice. Jesus died the death that you and I deserved. Through him, all our past, present, and future sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. And the water in the trench has been all licked up. Because of Christ work on the cross. When God sees us, he sees the righteousness that is of Jesus in us. He sees the righteousness that is of Jesus in us. The cross, this historical event, is how we know God loves us and God loves you. It is how we know the grace of God is much bigger and stronger than all sins that are combined throughout our lives. We become sons and daughters of God, redeemed, accepted, forgiven, and welcomed as He gave up His one and only Son, Jesus, for us. This morning, do you know this God? Has it occurred to you, Jesus really died for you out of love? You know, when you and I see ourselves as children of God, and when we know that we can talk to God as our Father, it gives us incredible peace. You know, life at times feels like the ocean that continually gets hit by the storms. You are tossed by one wave, and then there is another that hits you. But prayer is like a deep ocean current. Even though there are waves on the surface, there is still a real stillness underneath. And that is what God gives when we talk to Him. The worries of life don't seem so big anymore when we pray. Why is that? When we pray, we see that the God who is in charge is our Father. And our destination is beyond this life. And our eternity is secured in Him. Even death loses its sting when we are held in the arms of our Heavenly Father. But prayer does not just change us. It also changes our situations. God listens and he answers. There is the real power in prayer. In September of 2020, I received an email. 
it was about a lovely elderly lady in our church family whose health was deteriorating. She was moved into a nursing home at Bigra Waters, and I was informed that she was not doing very well. Her heart had only one artery working at the time, and her life was depending on little artery. As a result, she was tired very easily, and she had to be very careful not to damage it. And I remember our pastoral care leader shared the news with me, and we prayed together. And some of our church family prayed for her. Then, only a few months ago, I received another email about her. It said, a miracle happened. She's back home. What happened was that her heart somehow started growing new small arteries, which they would call the collaterals. And her health miraculously improved. The doctors said this rarely happens. And to those who are in her age group, it very rarely happens. A few weeks ago, I went to see her. And it was remarkable to hear her story in person. She said, look at me, Noah. How can you not believe that God is real? How can you not pray? You know, she said that she still can't go out for too long at a time. But she, shared, she shares her faith with whoever comes to see her at home that God is real and alive, telling her story. There is a real power in prayer. Prayer changes our situations. You know, I think there are two reasons that we would not pray. The first is that our prayers do not always seem to be answered. When God seems to be silent and our prayers do not change our situations, it is very hard, isn't it? Other times, when our prayers are answered, we dismiss the answers to prayers to be coincidence. But Elijah's story tells us that neither of these two reasons should stop us from praying. You know, the story tells us that even after God appeared in a fire on Mount Carmel, he still had to pray seven times until the rain came to the land of Israel. This is to tell us that the final goal of our prayers is not always getting the answer, but it is getting the presence of God. It is to learn how to trust in him. The seventh time Elijah prayed for rain, his servant reported. He ran and said, Master, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. The clouds of rain are coming this way. You know, hand in the Bible often means might or power. Friends, God is our Father. God is your father. You can cry out to him. He hears and he has heard your prayers. He has his hand on the very situation that you are praying for. And in his timing, you will see his hand. For the next 14 days, we are given the opportunity to do what Elijah did. That is to be filled with God's grace as we call him our father together in unity. And pray that we may see his hand in our situations. God will do something great in our hearts and in our lives and in our city and in our church as we seek him in prayer. And I love you to join us if you can. And let me finish with this. When I visited this lady a couple of weeks ago, this lady, lady gave me a card. And in it, there was a message that she wanted to share with the church family. It's really lovely. And let me read it for you. 
to each one for my church family. New Year 20, to, to 2022 will be special. Select a way to be special. Select a way to restore somebody today. Choose an inspiring verse from the Bible. And as you think deeply, you will change dramatically. Then share your concern with God and spread the love and kindness of God everywhere. Your eyes, your smiles, and your whole self. Then she quotes Psalm 27, verses 13 to 14, which says this, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Let us pray. God, our Father, we come to you this morning knowing that Christ has done all the work that we may confidently come to you. As we run to you, we know you welcome us as a loving father would pick up his child. Lord, we cry out to you. We pour out our heart. We ask that your presence will be with us and your hand will be in our situation. Jesus, help us trust and help us choose you when things get tough. And we thank you for the gospel message. In your name we pray this. And amen.